Good afternoon, section Zoom, uh, Saturday, April 11th, and I thought it would be a good day to start our study of zoning, chapter 11 in the Duke Minear text. So the first topic that we're going to take up is the constitutionality of zoning legislation. And the case that they give us for that purpose is a 1926 case from the United States Supreme Court, the Village of Euclid versus Amber Realty Company. Uh, the Village of Euclid, which I think was a suburb of Cleveland maybe, uh, had adopted a zoning ordinance that classified all the land within the village and uh, subjected it to three different kinds of restrictions. So there were use restrictions telling what kinds of activities or uses could take place on particular uh, por par portions of the property within the village. There were height restrictions restricting the height of buildings and then area restrictions that were setting minimum lot sizes. Um, so the use restrictions were uh, differentiated between U1 and U6 property. Um, and so U1 was the most restrictive, U6 was the least restrictive. Uh, each of the use zones was also overlaid with area and height zones. And so for instance, U5 property, which was for commercial uses, was subject to A4 area restrictions, which meant that corner lots had to have 900 square foot and interior lots had to have 700 square foot. And the commercial properties were also subject to H2 height restrictions, meaning that buildings had to be four stories or less or 50 foot or less. Um, so the most restrictive use category was U1. That was the area where you could have single family dwellings. You could also have public parks, water towers, reservoirs, electric train stations and rights of way, and farming, nursery, or truck gardening. Take a look at page 575. There is a diagram showing the property that is at issue in this case. The plaintiff owns this property between Euclid Avenue and this railroad line up here above. And part of their property, the portion that is down along Euclid Avenue, is subject to U2 use restrictions. So in U2 areas, you can do anything that you could do in a U1 zone. So you can have single family residences, you could have uh, a park, you could have uh, an electric train station or a water tower, um, but you also add another use that's permitted here. You can have two family dwellings in U2 zones. Uh, the next strip that they own is classified U3. Uh, in that area, you can uh, put various types of public buildings. You can have apartment houses, hotels, churches, schools, public libraries, museums, private clubs, community centers, hospitals, sanitariums, public playgrounds and recreation buildings, and a city hall and a courthouse. Um, and then the portion of their property, U6, which is up here by the rail line, is the least restricted classification of property. You can use it for industrial purposes, things like garbage incineration or aviation or cemeteries or correctional institutions and that kind of thing. Uh, now notice that the U2 property that the plaintiffs own is right on Euclid Avenue. Um, and one question we might have is, is it sensible to put U2 property right along Euclid Avenue? We're told that this is one of the three principal arteries or highways through the village. Um, so you'd expect there to be more traffic there. Uh, and yet they've put U2 property, which can only be used uh, or principally used for uh, single family dwellings or duplexes. And so uh, does it make sense to have your residential property right along a major thoroughfare? Would it be better maybe to have commercial uses there? Uh, but for whatever reason, they put the U2 property down there, perhaps so that they could keep it further away from the U6 property, <clears throat> where you might have a correctional facility or garbage incineration plant or something like that. 
Um, the plaintiffs allege that the adoption of this zoning ordinance has caused a really significant drop in the value of their property. And they're talking in particular about this U2 property right here. Um, but let's go up and take a look at what they say about the loss in value. Up on page 574, um, they say that before, uh, <clears throat> before you had this zoning ordinance, um, they had held this land for years for the purpose of selling and developing it for industrial uses. Uh, it's especially adapted for that purpose. It's near, uh, it's in the immediate path of progressive industrial development. So maybe Cleveland's industrial area was moving that way. But um, now that it's been restricted to U2 uses, uh, that for such uses, it has a market value of about $10,000, I'm sorry, for industrial uses, it has a market value of about $10,000 per acre. But if the use be limited to residential purpose, the market value is not in excess of $2,500 per acre. And so that would suggest a 75% drop in the value of their property. Um, or another measure, they say that the first 200 feet of the parcel back from Euclid Avenue, if unrestricted in respect of use, has a value of $150 per front foot. But if limited to residential uses and ordinary mercantile business be excluded therefrom, its value is not in excess of 50 dollars per front foot. So that sounds like 66%, two thirds drop in the value of their property from the adoption of the zoning ordinance. Um, and so one question we could ask is, does it make sense? Would you expect there to be a drop in the value of property uh, as a result of adopting a zoning ordinance? Um, and it does make a certain amount of sense if you think about it in terms of supply and demand with respect to this U2 property that, uh, that the plaintiffs own uh, down here on Euclid. Um, value uh, is determined by you know, supply, um, how much uh, property uh, there is, and demand, how much demand there is for that kind of property. Um, this uh, particular zoning ordinance hurts the plaintiff's U2 property on the demand side by restricting the potential uh, number of people who might be interested in that property. So if you want to kind of build a commercial uh, building or a factory or something like that, suddenly you're no longer interested in U2 property because it can only be used for residential purposes. So the demand for property uh, in this U2 category, presumably would go down significantly as a result of the restrictions on use of that property. Um, but the zoning ordinance does any, doesn't do anything to help them on the supply side because somebody who is searching for residential property could build it in a U2 area, but they'd, they could also go to a U3 area or they could go to a U6 area. So the people who are interested in residential property still have lots of options about where they could locate uh, a house. Um, so it makes sense, I think, to, uh, that adoption of the zoning ordinance reduced the value of uh, this property along Euclid Avenue, maybe even by a significant margin. Um, now, if people holding residential property are the losers under the ordinance, would you expect there to be any winners? Is there anybody whose property might ri rise in value as a result of the zoning ordinance? Well, let's, let's accept uh, the plaintiff's argument that they're kind of in the pathway for the expansion of industrial uses, that um, you know, industrial uses are coming this direction. Um, well, then maybe, this U6 property that they own, which is permissible for industrial use, has risen in value. Um, there hasn't been any reduction in the demand, um, but there has been a significant reduction in supply as a result of the zoning ordinance. So a lot less property within the village can be used for industrial purposes, which they say, uh, you know, are kind of coming their way. Um, and so if that demand continues strong and they are holding one of the now fewer parcels that can be used for industrial purposes, you would expect their U6 property to rise in value. 
Um, so it may call into question their overall claim that they were injured by the ordinance, but the court just kind of takes that at face value, accepts their allegation that the ordinance caused a reduction in the value of their, their land. Um, so this case started in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. And so that kind of raises a question about why we're in a federal court. What business do the federal courts have reviewing the ordinance of a, a village, little town in Ohio outside of Cleveland? Um, the federal courts are involved here because the plaintiff claims that this ordinance violates the United States Constitution. And the federal courts have uh, jurisdiction, therefore, because they are being asked to enforce a federal claim. Um, so the part of the Constitution that the plaintiff's claim is violated is the 14th Amendment. Um, so up here, the ordinance is assailed on the ground that it is in derogation of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to the Federal Constitution in that it deprives a Pelley of liberty and property without due process of law and denies it the equal protection of the law. Um, so we're going to put aside the equal protection uh, argument for a moment, but let's focus on um, the 14th Amendment due process clause, which is what the court ends up discussing in the portion of the uh, opinion ex excerpted in our book. Um, so the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution includes this clause, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the plaintiffs claim that the adoption of the zoning ordinance has violated that 14th Amendment due process clause. So notice, first of all, that this is a limitation on the state. Um, only states are restricted by the 14th Amendment. Um, where is the state in this case? Uh, notice we're challenging an ordinance adopted by a local government, by the village of Euclid, not a law adopted by the state of Ohio. And so why is the 14th Amendment implicated here? Um, and I think the answer to that is, well, Euclid by itself wouldn't have any power to regulate uh, its citizens unless that power had been given to it by the state of Ohio. And so when Village of Euclid adopts an ordinance regulating land use, it's exercising power delegated by the state, and that's where we get the state action. Um, now, the 14th Amendment protects any person against certain forms of state action. Do we have a person here? Well, we've got a corporation. Um, and so is a corporation a person? Legally, a corporation is a kind of an artificial per person, but is it the kind of person protected by the 14th Amendment of the Constitution? Um, the Supreme Court kind of has said, for certain purposes, corporations are persons protected uh, by the Constitution. And here, uh, the 14th Amendment would protect uh, a corporation, which is really, if you think about it, just uh, a group of persons all acting together, natural persons acting together in the form of this artificial corporate entity. Um, so has this person been deprived of life, liberty, or property? Um, well, it's been deprived of a certain kind of liberty, right, before the ordinance. It, could use its property in a variety of ways. After the ordinance, it uh, has less freedom to use its property the way it sees fit. So maybe it's been deprived of liberty in the, under the ordinance, or you could argue that it's been deprived of property uh, in the sense that property is a bundle of rights, and some of the sticks in that bundle have now been removed by the city, city ordinance, uh, they used to be able to do more things with their property. Now they can do less things with their property. So maybe they've been deprived of liberty and of property. Um, but notice that it says that nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 
So the 14th Amendment does not prevent the state from depriving you of life, liberty, or property. It just says if it's going to deprive you of those things, it has to afford you due process of law. Uh, and so in what sense do the plaintiffs claim that the taking, uh, that the regulation of their property deprived them of liberty or property without due process of law? Well, they're not making any claim about the process, the procedure by which this ordinance was enacted. They're not claiming that uh, the village of Euclid failed to follow the right steps to adopt the ordinance. Um, and so how can they argue that the, uh, that the village is depriving them of life, liberty, or property without due process? Um, doesn't seem that the phrase due process uh, relates to the procedures that you follow when you deprive somebody of liberty or property. Um, let's take a look at the opinion and see what the court says is the test it's going to use. Um, over on 575. Um, All right, 575 down at the bottom is what we want to look at first. Um, they say that the ordinance now under review and all similar laws and regulations must find their justification in some aspect of the police power asserted for the public welfare. And then a couple of pages later on 577, they're going to kind of give us a test at the end of the opinion, um, they say uh, that they, they are precluded from saying, as it must be said if they, before the ordinance can be declared unconstitutional, that such provisions are clearly arbitrary and unreasonable, having no substantial relation to the public health, safety, morals, or general welfare. So what is the police power of the state? Um, well, they refer to it here when they talk about the public health, safety, morals, or general welfare. Uh, the idea is that a state is deemed to have a general power to regulate the conduct of citizens in order to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and morals. And the shorthand phrase for that is the police power. Um, and so when the court says it is looking at the ordinance, it's deciding whether it is clearly arbitrary and unreasonable, or on the other hand, is this a valid exercise of the police power? So we said that the due process clause uh, seems to focus on procedure. Um, are, they are they looking at the procedure by which the ordinance was enforced uh, or, they or adopted? They don't seem to be. Instead, they're looking at whether this is a valid use of the state's power, uh, whether it's arbitrary and unreasonable on the one hand, or whether it's valid uh, to protect public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Um, this is an application of a theory that is called substantive due process. The Supreme Court has applied the due process clause of the 14th Amendment in two different ways, one of which is not controversial, and the other of which is very controversial. Um, the uncontroversial application of the due process clause has been what's called procedural due process, which you may have studied in your constitutional law class. Um, and in procedural due process cases, the court looks at the procedures used to deprive a person of life, liberty, or property and decides decide whether they afford due process to the individual who is suffering the deprivation. But in a different category of cases, the court applies a theory of substantive due process. And in these cases, the court reviews not just the procedures followed by the state, but also the substance of what is decided. Um, and so here the court is asking about the relationship between the ends or purposes that the ordinance is seeking to accomplish and the means it uses to get there. The court is deciding whether this is a reasonable exercise of the police power 
and whether there is a substantial relationship to the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare, uh, or on the other hand, does the court think it's unreasonable and arbitrary? Um, so historically, we need to step back a little bit um, and recognize that we are in the middle of uh, what Supreme Court historians call the Lochner era, uh, something that you may have read about or talked about in your constitutional law class. The period got its name from a New York decision uh, or a decision uh, by the Supreme Court coming out of New York called Lochner versus New York. Um, in that case, New York had adopted a statute that regulated the maximum work week for bakers. Bakers couldn't work more than 60 hours a week under this New York law. And the Supreme Court reviewed that law to decide whether it deprived somebody of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the court decided, applying a substantive due process theory, that the law deprived bakers and employers of their liberty of contract because it wasn't a reasonable exercise of the police power. Um, Justice Holmes was the writer of a dissenting opinion in the Lochner case. Uh, he basically accused the majority of being a bunch of social Darwinists who uh, didn't like regulation and who were just reading their own policy or political preferences into the Constitution. Uh, but he lost that case and the Lochner era uh, went on for a period uh, for 30 some years. Uh, the court struck down a wide variety of economic legislation um, this continued up through the period of the, uh, the Great Depression um, and even the election of President Roosevelt to deal with the after effects of the Depression um, and the New Deal. And so the Supreme Court was striking down some early New Deal legislation that President Roosevelt had convinced Congress to adopt to try to uh, get us out of the economic uh, depression uh, and its after effects. Um, the, Roosevelt was not happy with the Supreme Court striking down his New Deal legislation. And so that led to kind of his infamous court packing plan uh, where he basically went on the radio and he says, um, you know, we've got this problem that the Supreme Court justices, and I feel so sorry for them because some of them are getting older. It's harder to keep up with the workload that they've got. And so I'm going to ask Congress to let me uh, appoint a, a new justice for every justice over a certain age that doesn't retire. Um, even uh, the president's own party wouldn't go along with the court packing plan, but um, the Lochner era soon thereafter came to an end. In the 1930s, the court adopted a more deferential attitude towards the exercise of the police power by state governments and towards federal power. Um, and began uh, relaxing its, uh, its review of economic legislation. Um, so here, we're at the height of the Lochner era, and the court is reviewing a zoning ordinance under the theory of substantive due process um, in a theory where that, that uh, in a period when that theory was being fairly stringently applied. Um, so what does the court decide here? Does the uh, ordinance, violate the due process clause because it's arbitrary and unreasonable uh, because it's not a reasonable exercise of the police power in the view of the court. And here the Supreme Court in the Euc Village of Euclid case says, no, this, this is fine. This ordinance is permissible under the state's police power. Um, and so in kind of analyzing whether this falls within the state's police power, um, the court looks to the common law, and particularly it looks to the common law of nuisance, which as a starting point, everybody agrees was a valid exercise of the state's police power. Um, so how does the, the court use the law of nuisance? Does the village have to show that the uses it is restricting would be nuisances at common law? Well, the court doesn't go that far. What it says is the law of nuisances may be consulted, not for the purpose of controlling, but for the helpful aid of its analogies in the process of ascertaining the scope of the police power. So it draws upon uh, this sic utera principle that we saw articulated in the nuisance chapter, that everybody should use their property so as not to injure uh, that of another. Um, and so 
the court goes on and says a nuisance may be merely a right thing in the wrong place, like a pig in the parlor instead of the barnyard. Uh, if the validity of the legislative classification for zoning purposes be fairly debatable, the legislative just, uh, judgment must be allowed to control. But what they're drawing from the nuisance law is this idea that certain land uses are uh, in conflict with each other um, and that it, because of their location, they can create problems for each other and that the police power can validly be used to try and address those sorts of problems by requiring certain land uses to take place somewhere where they won't cause harm to neighboring properties. Um, so on page 576, the court first talks about the ordinances that set uh, maximum heights for buildings, that set material, uh, limits on materials and methods of construction that require areas of open access. Um, are those regulations valid exercises of the police power? Um, and the court says, yes, they are. In fact, everybody, there's no serious difference of opinion. Uh, those kinds of regulations minimize the danger of fire or collapse, the evils of overcrowding and the like. Um, and exclude from residential seg sections offensive trades, industries, and structures likely to create nuisances. Um, and so, um, in general, those kinds of restrictions are okay, but they point out that here the exclusion is in general terms of all industrial establishments, uh, and it may thereby happen that not only offensive or dangerous industries will be excluded. Um, so, you know, what if you have some fairly innocuous industry, like makers of clothing or something that uh, doesn't depend upon uh, burning a lot of fossil fuels and putting out noxious fumes, um, so that it doesn't seem like it's likely to create a common law nuisance, can the village also exclude those sorts of industrial uses from residential areas under the police power? Uh, and the court decides that they can't, that that is a permissible exercise of the police power. They say that the ordinance is drawn in general terms so as to include individual cases that may turn out to be innocuous in themselves, but they say the inclusion of a reasonable margin, margin to ensure uh, effective enforcement won't make the law invalid. In other words, it's easier to have a bright line rule that doesn't have exceptions to it. You can enforce it more easily if you say all industrial uses are excluded from residential areas. You don't have to make a case-by-case -case evaluation of each individual industry to see whether that particular industry could create problems in a residential neighborhood. Um, if you make the city specify all of the industries that it deems to be harmful and therefore excluded from residential areas, maybe they've missed some that should be excluded. Um, and the court makes this point that in some fields, the bad fades into the good by such insensible degrees that the two are not capable of being readily distinguished and separated in terms of legislation. In other words, um, yes, you might have um, innocuous industrial uses, but the differences between the harmful ones and the, the inoffensive ones, that's a matter of degree, and it's hard to kind of know where to draw that line in that continuum, and so the ordinance doesn't have to draw the line there. It can simply say no industrial uses will be permitted in residential areas. Um, so the municipality can exclude industrial uses from residential areas. The next thing it addresses on pages 567 and, or 576 and 77, is the restriction that excludes commercial establishments, um, apartment buildings and similar uses from residential areas. Uh, is that kind of a restriction permissible? Um, and the court says, yeah, that's also within the scope of the police power. Um, they talk about how there's been a lot of attention to zoning from commissions and experts, um, and there have been investigations that have produced reports 
Um, and they say these reports, which bear every evidence of painstaking consideration, concur in the view that the segregation of residential, business, and industrial buildings will make it easier to provide fire apparatus suitable for the character and intensity of the development in each section that, uh, that will increase the safety and security of home life, greatly tend to prevent street accidents, especially to children, by reducing the traffic resulting uh, and resulting confusion in residential sections, decrease noise and other conditions which produce or intensify nervous disorders, preserve a more favorable environment in which to rear children, et cetera. So think about the first one of these, um, fire apparatus, right? If you have an area of the city where you have industrial uses of property and there are chemicals being used that create particular kinds of fire hazards, maybe you need different kinds of fire equipment in that part of the city than you do in a residential area where it's just single family homes and they're separated from each other. Um, you know, maybe in certain parts of the city you need trucks with ladders to reach high buildings, but other in residential areas you can have different kinds of equipment that don't have ladders on them. And so, you know, it helps you figure out where do you put your fire equipment. Um, it helps you protect children in various ways. Um, there's less traffic in residential areas if you exclude all the commercial uses. Um, so there'll be fewer street accidents to children. You're not going to have as much noise. You're not going to have uh, confusion. Um, and you're going to just create a better environment to raise kids uh, if you exclude all of these other uses from residential areas. Now notice um, this point. They exclude also apartments from uh, residential areas. Um, and I think the court's uh, thinking about that is kind of interesting. They say that um, in a residential area, an apartment house is a mere parasite constructed in order to take advantage of the open spaces and attractive surroundings created by the residential character of the district. Uh, moreover, the coming of one apartment house is followed by others, interfering by their height and bulk with the free circulation of air and monopolizing the rays of the sun, which otherwise would fall on the smaller homes, and bringing as their necessary accompaniments the disturbing noises incident to increase traffic and business and the occupation by means of moving and parked automobiles of larger portions of the street, thus detracting from their safety and depriving children of the privilege of quiet and open spaces for play enjoyed by those in more favored localities. You get the sense that the court really likes low density suburban areas um, and it's trying to it thinks that it's justified for the village of Euclid to try to preserve that sort of area. Now one question to ask yourself is what if this case had been focused on the distinction between U1 and U2 property? Um, what if the plaintiffs had owned some of the U1 property uh, that uh, could be used for single family dwellings but they had wanted to build a duplex there and they couldn't because it was U1 rather than U2. Um, if that had been the issue the court was focusing on, then maybe it would have been a lot harder to explain on uh, some analogy to the law of nuisance why you are excluding duplexes from uh, areas of the city zone for single family dwellings. Um, so that is a good stopping point for our discussion of the constitutionality of zoning ordinances. And we will, in the next lecture, be talking about kind of the process by which zoning ordinances are adopted and enforced.